Um, so this is a picture uh, from 84, right? You were a bit younger. It's the Takoke plant, and uh, it was the Numi experience. And you had American people coming over here. And, and you wanted them to learn something from Numi. What, what did you expect them to learn when they came over? Could you elaborate on that? Oh, that's a good question for Mr. Yoshi. What did you expect the American workers to learn by visiting Toyota City? Oh, you asked him to. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought he, he's gonna, you know, anyway. Um, they came over to Japan to learn Toyota production system, but at the same time, um, as a first uh, training manager, no, first training manager, I was expecting them to learn how people treat the workers, how the bosses treat the workers, how they communicate with the, each other. I want them to learn uh, by just, you know, face-to-face -face talk and learn how people communicate with each other, how people treat. So that is, uh, uh, that is the main purpose uh, uh, of our training program. And how did you f facilitate that learning? Actually, uh, it's a three-week training. So first week, we provide uh, orientation in the classroom, just like this. It's, it's a small room. So, uh, but they are working people. So they are workers. They would like to uh, have more experience, and they would like to be to go to the shop floor as soon as possible. So uh, they, you know, we provide an opportunity for them to just spend uh, as much time as possible in the shop floor rather than in the classroom. And actually, they are very happy to go to the, the plant and shop floor and talk to the people. We partnered, you know, team leaders uh, with Japanese team leaders. We partners, you know, as a team. So they spend entire day, eight, uh, more than eight hours together, working together on the shop floor for two weeks. So what they can learn through skin, they just learn how people work, how happy they are, and what is their expectation in life, and all those things they learn, you know, through communicating with each other. So that is the chance that we would like to provide them. And when there were two weeks on the shop floor, you said they followed the Japanese counterpart. Well, what they f they were together, paired together with the Japanese counterpart. That's co right. Companion. For two weeks. What what did they do? Actually, they work just like just like the Japanese workers, <laughs> and uh, well, of course uh, they uh, they are not familiar with the way they work, uh, just like Toyota. So, so I think they slow. So they just a Japanese <laughs> trainer. Just uh, I'm sorry, but they, they train them or they just advise them how to do that. And uh, so they spend the entire day. Then they get to they get better, much faster. So uh, it's it's a great training. It's hands-on training. Hands-on training. And by your partner, so same level. So it's uh, the, uh, it, it's a great training. It's rather than in the classroom, but it's put them over there. You had team leader, supervisor over, and manager. Well, actually, yeah, team members. Above team members, uh, we have team leaders. And above team leaders, we have group leaders. Those are hierarchy. Then we have supervisor up there and section manager. So uh, were they working? In, so let's take a supervisor and a section manager. Would they work and produce cars also? Oh well, yes, actually, you know, workers that actually put all the parts of the work. And uh, leaders just watch, not watch, but they try to help them when they need some help. And the supervisors, you know, up there has more, you know, care about, uh, they are very careful about how to run their team. So more people, and they are uh, paying much attention to how, how to make people, make the, the employees uh, work in a happy situation. So um, the higher you go, the less work, actual work they do. Yeah. The more uh, effort is paid to attention to uh, the, the people working for them. It's, a, it's the same thing with other you know, organizations. It's nothing, nothing particular. You want to fill something in or add something, John? So one thing I could just add, it's same, partly the same thing, but, but lean the way we think of it, or the Toyota system is nothing if not a, and we've heard some of these words today, a social and a technical system. So what did we want them to learn? Uh, the technical side of how to build a car 
uh, Toyota way. Uh, but the other was the social side. So that's what they were experiencing also alongside their, their counterparts. And it began actually with, from the very first day. And this was the first day when the first group had arrived, uh, June 4th, 1984. And the first thing that Mr. Yoshino would do would be to memorize all the names. You, you just mentioned you haven't memorized the names of everyone here yet. You, 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 you would like to. But he would memorize all the names in, in one night. He'd write them all down. We, we, we would take this photograph and then uh, draw on the back of it, you know, one of those little like silhouette drawings so you can see all the faces and write their name there. And then he would memorize all of them. And then the next thing he would do, little known story, uh, he would take that and go down to the police department. <laughs> and he would tell the police department, if any of these people get in trouble these next two or three weeks, call me first. <laughs> <laughs> So this was a grand experiment. You've got to remember, now in 2018, everyone's, uh, of course, it's lean or t t Toyota Way TV. You can do that anywhere. At that time, no one knew that. And even uh, Toyota didn't know. Because Toyota had never tried to take its system in a holistic way outside of Toyota City. Even other parts of Japan. It's a very, as Mr. Yoshino said in this morning, it's a very unique, or anyway, a special part of Japan right in the center. And the idea that you could do it anywhere wasn't known. And, and Toyota, I think, is lean thinkers. We are also, we're nothing if not you know, believers in social technical systems, but also empiricists. We really want to know, does this work or not? And we want to prove that and see that and see the actual facts. And so it had never been done outside Toyota City. So the fact that this could work in California with this workforce, no, we didn't know. It was a grand experiment. And, and there was a lot of, uh, there are many eyes on this, is this going to work or not? In fact, this very group, when they were working in the plant, the prime minister came. Yeah, Japan came to look. He actually went to the plant to look at what's what, what's what was going on. So we didn't know, it was a grand experiment, and so that included things like, are these people gonna get in trouble at downtown every night? And so uh, he made sure that he was gonna be able to keep an eye on things <laughs> and make sure that no one got in trouble. So it was a lot of fun, right? It was a lot of fun. So in the, in the dormitory that where they stayed, actually, we took one room and made a little of a bar. We called it what, the Fremont, it was in Fremont, California. So we put a sign there that said Fremont Bar, right? right. Fremont and, and, and so we would go there every night and just after work and just talk to them, just uh, hear what they thought, what, they, what, they, what they, they thought they were learning, and we were learning alongside. So, so, so if I understand it correctly, it was hands-on training in the real environment paired with someone and also it's very personal to, to respect that person coming over. To connect yes. to them. Yeah. To connect with them. And I also would like to draw, I like to make connect. I was listening closely all day. I have 10 pages of notes as everyone was talking. Try to learn. And Denise started out, uh, Professor Kovahio started out this morning referring back to the first paper written in English. You asked for confirmation that that's really the first paper in English, and it is, I, I'm quite sure. Here it is. And here it is, cool. Yeah. And uh, good job. <coughs> wow. <laughs> That's very impressive. <laughs> but, but it's got the two parts to it that we often forget. You know, and in a forum like this, we don't forget. We'll say it. We're all smart people. We think of these things. But, but it's really, there's the technical part. You can say that's the technical part on the, on the top, right? Uh, reduce cost in many ways. And then this other part, the words are just amazing. Treat the workers as human beings. And and with consideration. I mean, that's just really remarkable. And that is at the core of what this is. Those two things together, not one or the other. But, but it, and how they interplay is, I think, something we're all still trying to figure out as we think about how to educate people or, or make this happen in, in, in other organizations, other countries, is how to get that blend just right, I think, is what we're always working on. So thank you for, 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 for showing everyone that. If you haven't read that, you should, 1977. It's a bit strange English, right? Uh, but but it's, a, it's, 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 very, it's a very nice thing to read. There's a lot of depth to that, including the technical part. It's got Kanban algorithms in there and everything, as well as the, kind of the social side. So we all know about the PDCA here. This is what you wanted them to learn. How did you check that they've learned this? <laughs> they learned. Well, actually, every time, you know, they just, uh, we prepare the bus to take them to the plant of the dormitory. So in the evening, probably around 5.30 or maybe 6 o'clock, they come back to the dormitory. And, and so they were sleeping in the same dormitory? Uh, same dormitory. Yeah. We, have, we have a dormitory over there and uh, for the employees, but we change it to kind of hotel. 
but it's, uh, there's no, you know, no nice uh, bar of restaurant, but it's, it's, it's a dormitory, especially for Nyomi people. Curfew. Curfew. <laughs> <laughs> we put the curfew. Stuff, what? Could you go back to that photo of the people? Yeah. yeah. He gave them a curfew. Yeah, because you know, they hadn't had a curfew their whole life. <laughs> <laughs> curfew means they had to be back and in bed by 11 o'clock, 11 p.m. Yeah, you, you warned the police and you gave them a curfew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we are, I was so worried about, you know, because they are new. They are, most of them have never been outside the state of California. So it, they don't know anything about Japan, anything about even, you know, they have never been outside of California. So anything may happen. And at that time, 35 years ago, it's, it's you know, foreigners walking on the street of Toyota City, none. So it, uh, pe people just watching them. So I was so worried about anything may happen. And so I took the curfew. It was not, they, they didn't like it. But still, it, I want to be on the safer side because if something happened, it destroyed the entire program. Anyway, that is, uh, I, I don't want yeah. to be mean, but it's uh, to, to make then, sure. But then you went back to check on their learning. We were the well, actually, yeah, every, every day, uh, most of, of the week, every day, yes, I come maybe 6 o'clock or 6.30 and dormitory, and it's it, uh, dinner time. So uh, uh, I, we sit down and, uh, and talk about oh, oh, how was the day, things like that. And it's that uh, I keep going there and ask a similar question to most of the people I run into. And it was great experience because if day by day, the reaction or the, the comment they, I received from them is slightly changing every day. And uh, it was a great experience. Particularly, I'm, I'm talking about uh, George Nano. George Nano is a very militant uh, 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 labor union leader, but I did not know that when he came in. And for some reason, uh, I did not know that. So I was just a very nice country boy type of guy. He's, uh, he's, he's old, he's a, uh, anyway. Um, he, he's very soft-spoken guy. So uh, I thought, okay, he's a uh, he's nice, nice guy. I did not know that he's military. And then at first, uh, he started, kind of started with a kind of negative impression. Okay, Yoshino san, we learned so many things in, in the first week about all the, all the uh, concept, but still we cannot, uh, we cannot understand it. Uh, but um, we spend entire day and watching everything. Why well, it's, I understand it, but still it's, it's uh, it, it, we cannot you know, put it. So it's a kind of, it's a mixture of negative and positive. The next day, more, a little bit more positive comment. So every single day, his viewpoint, his comment is changing very slightly toward more positive, which is amazing. So it's not only one day, but through, through all those two weeks, I tried to listen to him. And uh, so it was amazing that, you know, his way of thinking is slightly changing toward more positive and more people-oriented or more not protective themselves, themselves, but more positive and bring up all the problem, you know, openly. So something like that. It was a great experience. And uh, most militant guy is like that. So other people are more, more, you know, uh, open. And uh, so it was a great experience. And to see uh, their mindset is changing. It's, I'm not talking about, cult I don't know whether it's a culture is changing, it's not necessarily culture changes, but attitude or way of thinking is now changing. It's a great experience. I've never had that experience before. So that was really the training. Um, here we have another photo. A, a mix of two other people. I think, John, you're up on the... No, it's not you. Um, John is not the oil. It's, you know, similar style from this year. To, uh, yeah. <laughs> Close. Uh, but my question is more, is Toyota's approach to learning different to other organizations? Do you think that? Do you think Toyota's way of l having people learn is different to other organizations? You've been to Toyota all your life, so maybe John, or do you think it's different? Uh, I don't understand your question, but it's difficult. It's different. Or different. So, so let me try the first one. Okay. Let me give the first, let me give the first okay. try. One of the things you'll notice that Joku is kind of struggling to say this sentence of Toyota's way of helping people learn. 
Sure. That's because when we talked yesterday, Joker was using the word teach. Right? Exactly. It's an and easier we, sentence yeah, to say. Yeah. Is Toyota's way of teaching different? Is what you wanted to ask. Yeah. And Mr. Yosno spent about an hour struggling with that. And he basically said, we don't teach. We don't believe in teaching. Teaching has this nuance of, I'm going to tell, you know, rather, uh, and these are difficult words, kind of facilitate learning. So I think Toyota does have a view about how, especially adults, learn. I think it might be different if we're talking about you know, elementary school children. But adults, uh, adult learners, and there's a lot, I'm sure there are people in this room that are greater experts than me or on, on, on adult learning, adult learning theory. But Toyota does have a view, uh, and it's very simply that it needs to be experience-based. You know, yeah, there's nothing new there. It's experiential learning, so hands-on, learn by doing. Um, but that means more than just doing. It means you really want to structure work in a way that makes it easy to learn. So there are things that we did for this program that, where we did that, but actually it even goes deeper than that. If you look at the way work is structured. So, for example, I don't know how many times today I heard the word standardized work, and we all believe, you know, like standardized work. The, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm too little recognized the key part of standardized work is you want to structure the work in a way that enables learning every time you're doing your job, your job cycle every day. The work is structured that way, but back to that PDCA thing. When you build in PDCA, it's not only to make sure, standardized work is not about making sure people follow the tasks that you gave them perfectly. It's about designing the work in a way that gives a certain experience that people can be able to find mistakes, find problems, find challenges, find things that go wrong, find opportunities, and then they know what to do once they found those, that they know how to, op they know how to act on that, to be able to give a suggestion, or to call over a team leader to help out with a problem. So the work is intentionally structured in that way. So when we design standardized work, it doesn't mean just come up with the 10 tasks so that, okay, we can, you, know, you can properly attach the boat to the car. It's you're designing a work experience so people are learning. So there's kind of a, you know, a, a, a rough idea that 80% of what the company would try to do was, was facilitating learning through on-the-job experience. And then the, even it's team leader, team leader of the factory. So the, the, the work on the line, that team leader so is a, a coach, actually teaching. You know, they're, they're not just going over to fix something that goes wrong, they're teaching the individual to be a better problem solver, a better improver as they do that. And then if that's 80%, maybe another 10% is classroom stuff, like this where you have lectures. It's not, that has no value, it's just that that has its place. And then another 10% or so of, uh, of uh, kind of self-learning, helping you know, people get motivated to, to learn more themselves. Because learning really happens as adults when we become passionate about what it is we're trying to learn. Something like that. Yeah. Does that address your question? Do you want to add or should we go? Do you agree? Yeah. yeah. Um, now you're this age, and you always cut out John in the photos. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for leaving me in. Yeah, <laughs> I did. And, and in some years from, from when you were a new man doing this, would you have done anything differently now if you had had the chance to do it again? Well, um, before we received those software workers, um, it was, uh, when was it? Uh, June uh, 1984. Um, Probably, when was it? Two months earlier, maybe four, April, May, yeah, May, May, May. May. So one month earlier, we received the manager class of NUMI, which are sent, of course, sent from GM. And uh, so those people are, are slightly, not slightly, very much different from work, working people. And uh, so uh, they stayed a uh, while. So it's like paint shop manager? Oh, yeah, paint shop manager. Plant manager. You know, plant, manager plant manager are more closer to workers, <laughs> but I'm talking about administration like uh, public relations, the human Finance, resources, or the purchasing, yeah. and the production control, um, all those uh, uh, back office people. All those managers are very typical, uh, I don't know whether, what, what is typical, but typical GM people. So uh, they came over to Japan and spend, uh, spend one week uh, with us. <laughs> And their attitude, their uh, way of talking, their way of thinking, the way they respond to our questions is so different. Actually, they came in. I cannot compare, but because they came uh, came uh, earlier, that I was so surprised that they, the way they talk to us, is 
sounds like, oh, we are here, just we are sent over here unwillingly. So just, I don't want to learn anything from you guys. They don't say that, but I sensed it. So these guys came over here to learn what was for sightseeing or just spend some time. So uh, I was so kind of shocked. And I was talking with John. Oh, John is, is uh, how these guys are not so much serious. Uh, about learning something, about uh, getting something new. So uh, I was so surprised. So to, to make a long story short, if we do that one more time again, maybe it's a similar program for the workers, but maybe we have to provide more hardcore training for those people because managers are so important, their leaders are so important. If they are lazy or they don't care about the people, then people just can sense it. So. Maybe if I come back to the training manager again, then I will uh, try to establish some very hardcore training program for them. Maybe it's maybe three weeks, four, four weeks, or five weeks of training, and then uh, this, that is what I would like to have done. So it's really at the manager level you would address again. I think just so. something, try to do something different. I think so, yeah. yeah. yeah thank you, John. Uh, and you had the chance for, 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 for sure, uh, the, yeah. and and we did. In subsequent programs, Mr. Yoshino left uh, after Numi to do other uh, other jobs, rotation, and I stayed also a couple more years. I was in Toyota City doing this work for five years, and so after Numi, we had a chance for Kentucky to do work on the Kentucky Project, Ontario, and also the UK um, and other places, and so we did add more uh, focus on the managers. But what we learned, but but just to add a little bit even more to that, in the sense that we were so focused on and, and not confident if the workers would accept this or not. So we were really just focused on that. Because it's worth emphasizing, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with this, this, this case, this project, the NUMI project, but it really was a, a case from worst to best, and almost overnight, just in, in, in one year. And it was the, the, the photograph there, that, that was, uh, had in, in their previous life, it was a horrible workforce. So we had reason, to, he had, Mr. Hughes had reason to be concerned about the police. <laughs> Inside the old factory there, they had, there, there was a room in that factory that was twice the size of this room with a lock on it. The management was not allowed to go inside. Can you imagine? What was in that room? The, a casino. <laughs> there was gambling, a casino in the plant. The management was not allowed to go inside. There was prostitution, there were drugs, there were fights. There were, I knew a case where a couple of guys wanted to leave early and so they put the plant on fire. This is the same workforce. So he was talking about before about the union leader, George Nano. He had led, he had personally led illegal wildcat strikes that had shut GM down for six weeks. So this was the people we we're talking about. But little did we know, so we were concerned naturally. We weren't concerned about the educated you know, manager. So there's, you know, there, they're people who obviously know the right things to do. Uh, but it turns out the workers were fine. The workers were fine. And in fact, in every case I've seen in 35 years, the workforce will be okay. They'll prefer this way of working. There may be pushback, there may be whatever kind of resistance as they're going through change, but it will be better because it's a better way to work. But So the issue is the managers and the leadership, and I think we've all learned that over the years. So we didn't know that in the beginning, and we learned it, so that's something we would probably Yes, I would agree that we would do, do differently. But how did you do it in Kentucky? Did you do longer or different or? There was an extra week added for the workers because in Kentucky, in, in the case of NUMI, they had worked for General Motors before, so they actually knew how to handle a, 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 an impact wrench. Yeah. They had to do how to do those, those basic skills. In the case of Kentucky, there were people who had previously, they'd been school teachers. They worked in a grocery store. So they, they needed the more time to learn yeah. the techniques. And then there was also extra extra time and attention given to the managers as well. But looking back, even more, uh, even more could, have, could, have, could have been done. Because it is so key. And for the managers, it's not the, the screwdriver. What, what would you learn that more? Well, no, I, but it might be more time actually working on the line to feel so what, the to, line. to, to imp, imp, you know, be able to truly empathize with the, with, uh, with the workforce. Your job is to make them successful, so you need to truly understand that work. I think that still would be an important part of it. Okay. Um, this is some slide you have. If you were a new employee at Toyota, how do you develop them? And, and what's, your, what's your view on a new employee at Toyota? Okay, uh, when, uh, when you join Toyota, 
we don't put them uh, right away to the shop, uh, to the, 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 the places uh, they will start working. No, so we put. Um, so if I was employed in, in, in some yeah, place, we would put them you know, the uh, orientation, and then maybe two or three months we have to do, uh, give them uh, training, and uh, separate from uh, working. And so uh, it's, it's a classroom training, also hands-on training uh, in the shop floor. So. Um, it's a very, very hard for training is given to the newcomers and uh, so that they can sense it. Okay, this is a way Toyota is run. And uh, it's, it's classroom training, you cannot give all the, all the information. So we have to put them in, in the plan, shop floor. And I was, when I joined Toyota uh, in 66, I was uh, uh, at the time uh, only just uh, factory training only. But uh, maybe two, maybe five or six years later, then. Uh, sales training is added, but at the time I was put in the in the production plant, uh, Motomachi plant, where uh, Tracy that was uh, was was made, and uh, so uh, I was uh, uh, working for their day shift and night shift, just like exactly uh, workers. It was a great experience. What did you um, learn? Hmm? Well, Could you give an example? Yeah, we saw uh, you know uh, what couple of things. One is that. That the relations between boss and subordinate very close with each other. Even though the boss and subordinate, but they just talk with each other just like family members. And also another thing that it stuck me is that I was I was in the painting shop. Paint shop. And the painting shop, and uh, I was uh, my job was to put the yeah. This is what happened to me. You know, I, I put uh, I need to put this uh, pigment a. And, pig, and the solvent A put in the same tank, and each tank mix it together, then send it all the way to the paint shop. So my job was to fill in all the other, uh, those uh, so materials. So you were preparing the paint yeah, for the paint. Yeah, the paint. The yeah. paint, yeah, and then, you know, the, every maybe two or three hours. Then, for, for some reason, you know, a couple of hours ago, uh, later, the, the guys from the paint shop just came over, rushed to our op office now. A warehouse and something, oh you guys, something wrong, the paint does not stay on, on the panel. So something is wrong. So then we are so, so surprised, so we just check. Then we found out that I put the wrong, you know, wrong paint, pigment, and the wrong, uh, right, right uh, uh, solvent, but put wrong uh, pigment to, into the tank. So that was my mistake. However, so, so then when they painted the Color didn't stick on yeah, the color that doesn't that's, stay yeah, that's on, on the panel. So, but so your, what's it your came story? out so much, uh, out, so many hours later. But uh, the, I was so scared because we, because it's my mistake. And you I were put, young. Yeah, I put the wrong one. But you know, it's a, that's a huge mistake. Yeah, that's a huge mistake, mistake because maybe twenty or thirty uh, cars has to repaint it again. So it's a huge maybe line is stop. But you know, I was so surprised that. At the time, I was so scared because it's, it was just maybe two, two months um, after I joined. Then nobody tried to blame me. The, uh, the group managers came over. Yoshino, just what did you do? Okay, put this one down. Oh, you put this one, but it looks like, you know, looks like it's a pigment A, but the pigment B, but it's not your mistake. It's our mistake because we did not assign any space for the pigment A and pigment B, we did not that. We've been doing this for years, so we, we know that, but you just, you and you, so it's not your mistake, it's our mistake. So what? they did not blame me, and instead, uh, they learned something, so just, you know, uh, actually the, the bosses, so don't worry about it, we learned something, so they they thanked me, you know. We, we, they, you gave me, the, your failure just gave me the chance to learn, to make some improvement, so. I was so, so surprised to find the, the way they just treat me. And so I, I was so happy to, to see that what happened to me. So I was so, at the same time, I was so proud to join this company. So that was my first uh, experience. But that was your first real experience? Oh yeah, it was so, so great. It really, really uh, meant a lot to me. I think everyone who does that plant training has a similar experience. Yeah. However, I don't think I've heard of anyone making a bigger mistake than that. <laughs> um, but the fact that after that they said thank you, and then that's an opportunity to improve the process, is pretty remarkable. 
And I think getting back to the two points of the old paper about uh, respecting people with consideration, I think that, that shows it in, in, in practice. So how is your, your new employee once also, John? And, and I think this is from your A3, right? Yes, that is an old A3 that I did. And how was your experience as a new employee? Uh, let's see. Uh, well, honestly, it was fantastic. I did the plant training, and uh, Mr. Yoshino would come by and check on me regularly. And I had a similar experience, in fact, uh, of where I was uh, pulling the cord to ask for help frequently. And I had the same experience in terms of it was the focus was on uh, how I could learn and how I could help identify ways to improve, improve the process. And one of the outputs of that, I think, relates to some of what was the discussion today as well. So when we think of the kind of culture, and I'm like Mr. Yoshino, I'm kind of sometimes scared of the word culture. It's such a big word. It's kind of amorphous. What does it mean? But the idea of, of no blame, so that there's not a fear that you have a problem, you make a mistake, and you can truly raise that no with that. And you design the work, you design the environment such that it, that it encourages, encourages that. And through, the, and through the entire thing, you're trying to develop these thinking problem solvers. You're trying to develop people as, as thinking human beings, honestly. And so this uh, A3 is another Another piece of that. And so uh, out of the factory floor, you're doing physical work. You, you, so you try, it manifests itself in that way. So here's your work, which is to mix the pigment and the solvent and mix up the paint and send it over to the paint shop. Okay, now how's that working? How can you make it better? You know, first of all, we made those, kind of, those kinds of opportunities for problems. But then we go back and you know, we're working in, in the office. We're doing us, you know, now we use the word knowledge work or uh, terms like that. And so how do you do improvement and how do you develop someone's thinking there? And there's where Toyota came up with this idea that Mr. Yoshino was so very involved in that he talked about some this morning with Compro. And that's the idea, the basic idea of an A3 is you put all your thinking on one piece of paper. That, that's the basic thought. Give me all your thinking on one piece of paper. If it's gonna be one piece of paper, how about using a big piece of paper? <laughs> so it's A3 size. And from there, you can have a lot of conversation. By you're sharing your thinking, I'm sharing my thinking, we go back and forth. It's a matter, of, it's a matter than a, if, if the work in the factory is easy to see, it's visible already, maybe more visible. But then in an office, it's not. So where's the work taking place? It's inside between the ears. So how can you make that visible? So that's what this does. And so this is an early one that I did. Do you uh, remember what it was? Or maybe it's not significant. Well, it would have been, I do remember when it was because you can't quite see it there, but there's a stamp in the middle, uh, and that is Mr. Yoshino's stamp of approval. Up here? Yeah. So you have responsibility for it. Yeah, right. <laughs> so it, that means it was within the first two or three years I was there, so probably about 1985, 1986, but that's where I'd gone through a process of trying to analyze some work that we were doing um, and come up with uh, you know, a better way to go about it, which is all fine, but it's really the give and take throughout. It's the catch ball, the give and take. As I was writing something, I mean, I don't know how many iterations I did of this, but it was, uh, I don't know if it's countless, but it was <laughs> close to countless. And, and what was your role then, Isaiah? Well, as, as, as you see that my uh, stamp is right there. That means approved. But when you approve, that means I am responsible for the, what this means. So what we have to, you know, bosses have to spend a lot of time sharing his opinion, that, that discussing all whether this is right or wrong. Just, you know, I'm responsible, that, that's a sign. So that means we are the same page. And uh, even though I'm a boss and he's subordinate, but still we are both responsible for this one. And so that makes subordinates feel comfortable, and then I feel comfortable that, oh, the, I, I'm taking care of this guy. And so we just like family members. So this creates a lot of nice uh, relations between the boss and the subordinate. And uh, also, uh, it's a great learning for us uh, as a boss. You know, when I, we are coaching something, we have to think it over and over again, deeper and deeper, and so that we can make a good advice. So it's probably we can learn more things than than our subordinates and going through these uh, history papers. 
you want to add something? Or? Well, I could add more. What do you yeah. what, what, what? Well, I was thinking, you said coach. How, how, how do, you, do you think you were coached, John? What was your, it was Isaiah giving you do this or only asking questions or is it a mix or? So, gee, I could, again, I have to be <laughs> concise here. I could stay and talk about this all night long and no one wants that. We're gonna, we're gonna go to the, I'll tell you one kind of important point of, of uh, tipping point for me, I guess, was about three years in, so around the same time as this, when it finally occurred to me as I'm thinking about this, I'm work so I was the first American there, okay, just to go back to, again, his fear about all these uh, newbie people roaming around town. When I arrived there, not long before that, I was the only American, me and 70,000 Japanese. And I remember the first time that I walked in the cafeteria and everyone looked, all these eyes looked up. What on earth, I was wearing a little jacket jacket. What is this person doing here? So it was a time of tremendous change that, 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 was, that was occurring. And so every day was a learning experience. And we all have times in our careers where we really were learning a lot, right? It's not necessarily all 30, 40 years of, of a career are all full of learning, but there are times when you're learning a lot. And this was just, this learning curve was like this. And it was great. But it was only about three years in that I realized that, that in, in that three years time, never, never, almost never, was I given a solution to a problem like this? I was never given a solution. I was never told exactly, here's what you need to do. But I, it, it, the funny part of that realization is that it took me three years to notice that. Because they didn't tell you that either. They didn't tell me that either. Yeah. And it was, I was so clearly directed though, in terms of what I was trying to do. I was so focused on what needed to be done. I didn't notice that no one was, was not telling me what to do. I was being given problems that they were gonna do everything they could to make sure that the ownership stayed with me, that they didn't take it away. And what happens when you tell someone what to do? I mean, three things happen when you tell someone what to do. Number one is you take the ownership away. Why'd you do that? You told me to. That is taken out of the equation or the, the way that I was being developed or they were developing each other. The other thing is you take away the opp opportunity to think, which is obvious, but taking away the responsibility and wanting to keep the responsibility with each person is just huge. Now, the third reason you want to be careful about telling people what to do is you might be wrong, right? They know the work better than you do, so be, you want to be careful. So you give someone the problem and you have them come back and propose solutions. It doesn't, it, it, to, in my American mind, it was, uh, you know, it's, everything's a dichotomy, right? It, it's it's, it's a, often a false dichotomy. So either I'm deciding what I'm, I do or you're telling me what to do. This was neither of those. I was given responsibility to propose solutions, and as I proposed, I was getting coaching back on how to think it through better. I had to think it through a different way, things that I had not thought of. And so when I would occasionally uh, get told what to do uh, by either Mr. Yoshino or my other boss, it had been that we had both failed. I, I failed to think through to, to a better, better way forward, and they had failed to be able to mentor me, to come up with the right question, to come up with the right metaphor, or, or, or whatever it might take to, to kind of take my thinking to another level. So it took me three years to kind of notice that, because everything was so focused on getting the job done. We knew we had to perk you know, develop an organization to build perfectly, uh, perfect high quality vehicles in, 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 in uh, Numi with a workforce that, had, you know, with a horrible record. That we knew that was the focus, that was the overall challenge or problem. You know, it says problem, problem to solve, but maybe that's that negative language can often be thought of in different ways, but it was a challenge. So how can we run experiments? How can we do things to, to learn and learn our way to a better future? So this was represented, so this is all built into that piece of paper and others, others like it. Does that make sense? Right. So when I first got that, I did actually, you don't remember this, I went to you at that three, three year point. I said, hey, is this what's going on? And you said, yeah, sure. <laughs> I said, well, it would have helped if you told me that. And you said, well, <laughs> Do you think it would have helped? That's a great question, I suppose not. I mean, maybe it would have shortened it, but it also might have made the experience less deep. The learning might have been less deep. This way, it was an experience, it was experiential learning that was very deep. That's what I wondered that myself when I've done some trainings, not as long, but in Japan. And it's like, would it be better to explain what was happening or not? I don't know. I don't know either. We'd like to think that there could be a more perfect way, you know, to get there in yeah. a shorter timeline. Yes, but you know, I, I think it's true that, that we humans kind of learn through mistakes and failure. That's the strongest lessons we get. Does that mean you can allow you know buses to run off the road and for a busload of people? I know. 
right? So it's a really a lot of complex questions here, um, to be sure. But I, boy, I just don't want to let go of the fact that this morning, uh, the admonition for all of us to avoid the copycat syndrome yeah. with, with the space shuttle, what have you, mm -hmm. is so true. So, I, and also, we're sitting up here, I always feel remiss sitting up talking about Toyota too much. In fact, I don't usually talk about Toyota a lot, unless someone asks, because it's not about Toyota, and they're not perfect. They did manage to, in this place in Japan, uh, that something emerged there that was a pretty remarkable, that I think we can learn from, but just copying them is not going to get us where we want, want to go, I think. So it's a matter of how we can use that as some sort of mirror uh, to learn from. And, and that was an important insight this morning that came up that I wanted to And we discussed before, what's a vaccine against copying or antidote? Uh, so uh, so in, we, in, in our brief session, the learning session or breakout that we had today, I, th I think any time we start with saying you should do this, you should start here with a prescriptive approach, uh, we're going down a path that's going to get us in trouble eventually. You might get some progress that way. But the more we can begin every step with a question, which is what I was getting from day one, the more we can begin with questions, uh, the better we can have, I think, an antidote to this problem of, 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 of copying. So we can learn from, we can read that 1977 paper, we can get insights, but just to blindly copy that, uh, I think will always lead to, uh, lead to trouble. So begin with questions, which is what scientists do. So if the, the theme here is educate, right? how can we bring lean thinking into education? I think that behooves us to do exactly that. We need to follow that medicine. We need to be scientists as we think about facilitating learning. That means, I think, I think that has to mean you begin with questions. Oh, it's not with a prescriptive, do this, start here. And, and that gets back, kind of back, you said theory is like 80% experiential learning, building cars. Uh, I don't think the people that come from university here, here have, are building cars. They have classrooms. So how can you get that on-the-job training in a setting like that? Okay, I'll, I'll take that one too real quickly. Um, actually, there were some sessions I had to miss today, but, but I think through closer cooperation, collaboration between universities and companies, so projects. I think there were some discussions today of having students go work on projects, come back with an A3 uh, report. That kind of thing. So this is actually, this is me working on the line. This uh, photograph was taken, you know, it was taken by, uh, at the instruction of Mr. Yoshino who was standing there. And I was getting, so, so to do the work, if, if experience, if we do believe, we have to believe, right? If you think about adult learning, you want to experience. Therefore, and I spent years in the university as well. I spent 10 years teaching at the University of Michigan, so I know the challenges. But if we have to find some way that, pe that, that the, the learners can be getting experience that brings these lessons home. And so if we can be finding ways for co-ops or finding ways for students to work on projects at companies, then we can start to have some blended model, I suppose, uh, where there's, sure, there's, there's didactic you know, uh, teaching and there's reading papers, there's reading books, but to blend that with some experience, I think is something we have to think of better ways to do. And that's why this gathering every year, I think is so important. So we can think, we can share ways that we're, we're trying, ways we're experimenting to do exactly that. You want to fill in, I think, no? We're good. Yeah. Uh, we have some time left, and I, I don't want to take all the questions. Uh, so if anyone in the audience has a question concerning the matter we discussed, I, we? I'd like to open up. Yes. A good question. No, or about <laughs> any question. I have one, but it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Too much pressure. Yes, Dennis. No, 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 it's not good. No. <laughs> but it's funny, maybe. No, it's not funny. <laughs> well, okay, we have to hear it now. Yeah. yeah. I, didn't I, mean, have you, any. I just said that, but I didn't have any. <laughs> so, any thoughts about this talk that you're thinking about and would like to learn a bit more? And questions? Or just share. Yeah, yeah. Or just share. I can, ask, I can ask a question that's not related with the learning, but related to research. Oh, because, uh, you know, some I'm going to stop. Can you in the back here, Denise? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's okay. Otherwise, speak up. Okay. Um, some of us are. Okay, me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the micro. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, some of us are professors or teachers or lecturers at universities, and our job, part of our job is, of course, you know, helping students to learn, but uh, some part of the job is to do research and put some science in this. So I think this area is not very well developed and established in the society or in the community, in the scientific community. Actually, uh, my colleagues, they look at me and say, you do easy things, so it's not, they are not very complicated in order to be considered science. And um, actually, I think, I don't see, I, I, I think we can reach that, but I don't see exactly how at the moment. So if you could say something about that, it would be very nice. I will say that I agree 100% we need that. And in fact, at LEI these last years, I kind of tried to initiate some things. And honestly, I, I don't know how to do it. But we have people that know how to do that. And I think we are behind. I think that's a reason. So lean has not been fully embraced, I guess. It's really a scientific discipline. And if it's not, then that's a problem for us in terms of bringing the change that, that we want. So I, I guess what I want to do is implore <laughs> everyone to join you to think about how to do that. I'm going to give this to John Pacino, even though he didn't ask for it. I've been around this question for a long time. Okay. That'll save me. I just want to add a comment about whether it's scientific or not, because now I represent the lean construction part more than the lean production. And within lean construction, it is actually much more theoretical. And you find lean construction in various universities that work with these areas. So I believe that there is people that actually work with these matters. So it's just a comment to that that it is actually. <coughs> so um, what is your experience regarding the kata? So I know kata is not a term, as I know in, in Toyota. Uh, but did you experience some routines like my daughter describes in his book? And what is the difference from your point of view regarding a tree? So what is the difference between uh, A3 and Kata, or how does Kata maybe relate to this? Um, uh, let's see. Um, so for so routines. So what is so sometimes I, I, I worry about taking some Japanese words and then they take on a life of their own. One, in fact, is hoshin, which uh, we do talk about a lot. And sometimes I'll see sentences where it's completely circular logic. Well, you need to have your hoshin to have your strategy. You no, know, you need to. It becomes a nonsense. As if you said the word hoshin, did it somehow solve some problem? So what is kata? Right? It, 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 it's, 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 traditionally, it's a practice routine. It's a way to build habits. Uh, and as such, it's extraordinarily powerful. Right? It's, it's absolutely, it should be part of this. And in fact, the way I was describing this designing standardized work before is an experience, 100%. We want to think about, for example, when we design work, what we want people to think about, and what we want them to not have to think about. Right? So that means careful design of the work to build in, in so, some, some kind of project. I heard several times today people talking about how it's not about tools and techniques, which is kind of true. But I'd like to add some coloration to that. Kata is, at the end of the day, a technique. It's a technique. And actually, where there's tools or techniques carefully, just beautifully designed, they can really help us move this forward. Beautifully designed tools and techniques that embody the thinking. The problem is, we've often taught these tools and techniques as only the technical side of them. Every single one of those lean tools is a, has a 50% social side. That's what we've left out. And that's a shame. And that's a shame on us for doing that. Whether it's Kanban, or standardized work, or Andon, or A3, or any of these things, it's equally, in my view, 100% equally, that's 50-50, social and technical in, in its, in its uh, intent. And if we only teach the technical side, of course, we totally, yeah, that, that was a big mistake. So it's not that the tools are techniques. It's, at the end of the day, a technique, right? It's not that it can't be powerful, but we need to understand it, okay, in, in a holistic way and how it fits into overall what we're trying to do. I think that there's also some really deep fundamental thinking 
that is beyond, I don't think any one thing, either the day three or Kata, is the full story, the full answer to what we're trying to do. We, under, we heard some really deep thinking that went into, I mean, you mixed the wrong paint to paint. Do you realize the cost involved? Of, that, that's an incredible mistake he made. And the owner of that operation out there in the plant floor come, comes up and says, thank you. There's something really deep going on there that we need to understand. So uh, Kata and A3, you, you could even say they're, they're different, they're, they're the same thing applied in different arenas, in, in, in different ways, in different occasions. I, that's what I think. Is, is that good enough for now? We can talk more over uh, Crystal. Over adult beverages later. Too. Yes. Numi was learning lean from Takaoka and said obviously verb. GM was trying to learn lean from Numi. Do you think that verb and why or why not? Okay. So this is actually a more interesting or useful question in a lot of ways than the success of Numi itself. Numi now we know if you do these things, do them well, a, a plant a factory can turn around. It can work. We we, we showed that. That was the worst workforce. <laughs> and all those things went from the worst quality to the best quality and all those things. In some ways, a more a useful question may be than what happened at General Motors. Uh, GM, and, and I'll include Mr. Yoshino here as well, but GM was there to learn. It was a 50-50 joint venture, and there was no secrets withheld. Okay, we know that. All the GM folks uh, worked there. They had a chance to learn everything. And many of them did, I'm going to say. I'll connect my, my oh, there are many parts of the answer. I'll, connect, I'll, I'll make part of the uh, answer connected to my last comment about Kata, which is that I would say that a lot of the GM people actually did learn, and they mainly learned the technical side only, to make the social side and the management side and the fundamental thinking side take hold in General Motors, that big monster General Motors, a massive, massive undertaking. And uh, after 10 years or so, they was, began making, for the first 10 years, there was no progress at all. The first GM guys who worked at Numi, after three years, they were sent back, and they said, send us back to one place so we can all work as a team. If we're all together in one plant, we can make some change. General Motors and the Wisdom said, no, we can't have just one shining light. We need to scatter you all over the company. And uh, just as those, those guys had learned enough to, to know that that wasn't going to work. And they said, please send us to one place where we can work together, and GM did not. They scattered them around. It didn't work. So 10 years later, um, there was a new CEO of General Motors, Jack Smith, who had been involved in the early Numi story, and who knew. So he then began to gather those people together, hired a bunch of people from Toyota, uh, and uh, began to really make some you know, model sites, or just make, make some nice progress. But even that is such a big battleship. Um, and for example, labor management relations, if that's, or how to work as a team. If that's one of the big lessons out of Numi, that lesson did not make its way through General Motors uh, very well. So I'll stop there and ask Mr. Yoshino <laughs> too. Well, nothing to add, but my personal opinion is that um, managers who have so many people working for him or for her, if managers are not serious about his own role, to develop people working under him, under him, under her. If he's not serious, that those guys are not serious, then nothing happens. Something happens, but it does not create some you know, sense of unity or something, or more positive attitude. So uh, I believe that the manager's role is very, very important, and the most important thing is, as, uh, as uh, John said, social part, which is the more people side uh, uh, should be more, you know, more focused on that. And uh, the technical side, you can you can learn in, in 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 many ways. But social side, you have to put yourself on on, uh, on the forward, and also take you know take care of the people, and and you have to seriously think about that is ma one of the ma major role. Otherwise, you know, you cannot make any progress. So that is my uh, commitment. So I, I'm teaching at Nagoya Gaku University and one of the major role uh, over there is that how to coach or how to help my students to climb up to the, the level uh, gradually. So I'm trying to listen to them very carefully and trying to make them talk, make them think deeper 
and it's very a lot of uh, patients require. But I, I spend more uh, on the social side, which is more people side, rather than technical technical side. And so it's uh, to, it, to conclude my comment is that it's so important for for the managers or leaders to be to be very serious about developing people working for for that person. And uh, unless you forget it, then uh, I, you can get some. Uh, a target attained. Okay. Okay. Do you want to add the last word? Just, yeah. just one more. Which is the way it raises a little bit to even to the kata question, which is that if kata is a technique or a three is is a is a process, they have to be in the service of something. What is it you want to accomplish? What is your purpose? I think there's an underlying purpose question that has to precede anything that a company tries to do, an organization or a team or, 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 or people get together. Why are you doing this? What is, what is your purpose? In GM's case, what, is, what was their purpose? Shareholder value. Okay? I, I won't say that that's exactly wrong, but that's what it is. Is Toyota's purpose shareholder value? No, no, it's a holistic look at stakeholders and what's needed to contribute to society. The very underlying, so the purpose of this, this kind of change does require a long term and a very deep commitment to change. Now, if you're thinking about, you know, 90 day stock price, that is not gonna be supportive of this kind of change. So that's another thing I would add, okay, they didn't learn the social side, but another is that the, the purpose, there's a mismatch. And so that's a big problem that we see as far as lean change in companies everywhere all the time. So uh, what is your purpose? And Toyota can explain its purpose. And it was, it would, if it, Toyota would have explained its purpose 30, 35 years ago. In fact, Toyota did. And when the GM folks would listen to that, they just rolled their eyes. <laughs> you know, that's, that's fine. We want, yeah, we want the cost reduction. We want the better quality. We want, you know, those kinds of things. But that's ancillary. That's a result in the Toyota way of approaching it. So the very purpose is uh, different. So, so as far as what lean is, so, so if GM was trying to absorb lean and do lean to make money, uh, Toyota has, is doing what it does, okay, and using lean, lean techniques and tools to be able to serve a, a, a deeper purpose. It wants to make money, but so it can actually then, then uh, you know, uh, contribute to society. That's what they would tell us. And I don't think it's just PRBS. I think it's true. I think there's uh, you know decades of evidence that shows that it's it's a real genuine purpose. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for listening. Uh, warm applause to John and Sal.